All right, I'm going to be presenting today on intrasite spatial analysis of uh, seven open air middle paleolithic sites in France. Uh, all of these sites um, just had lithics preserved, they're open air sites. There weren't any bones or other material preserved, so that's why I'm really focusing on lithics here. So uh, one of the things to know about uh, France <laughs> is that uh, here's a geologic map just to show that there are some areas with uh, lime, uh, that are rich in limestone or have limestone uh, deposits where it's very, very rich in chert sources. And in these areas, you can find a lot of open air sites with a lot of um, material uh, napping debris. So that's characterized um, something just to keep in mind in the seven sites that I'll talk about today. And so here's the distribution of some uh, middle Paleolithic open air sites in France. Those in boxes are the sites that I studied in my analysis. Um, and then I just included some others. And as you can see, they kind of match with these areas where um, we have up in the northern part of France a lot of limestone and a lot of chert deposits. And then the same in kind of the southwest uh, part of France. And so this. Uh, the study, the uh, sites I analyzed were Betancourt, Croix Noir, Villiers Adam, La Foily, Bossuet, Cantelouet, and Le Prise. And all of these sites were uh, excavated by INRAP, l'Institut National de Recherche Archéologique Protective. And so these were um, excavated prior to construction pro uh, projects, and so they were excavated at very large scales. Um, and really in their entirety. So this is just one example, uh, Betancourt in the north of France and, and Lust deposits. So it's a very, very large scale excavation. We're talking about uh, hundreds of square meters. Uh, here's another uh, excavation, Croix Noir, um, also excavated very large scale. Uh, so they're really perfect sites to study intrasite spatial analysis. And the sites in general, they really, um, there's quite a variation in terms of the density and the types of sites. So here's one extreme, La Doline de Cantelouet, where it's actually situated on a, um, where the, the uh, raw materials are coming out of the ground, and it's just extremely dense. So there's a lot of um, complete nodules and a lot of uh, reduction debris, and very, very dense. But then on the other uh, side of the spectrum, we have a site like uh, La Foily, which is situated on a floodplain, and it's very uh, low density, has excellent preservation. Uh, there's, in fact, um, uh, post holes that were preserved, and uh, this kind of uh, non-pedogenic, uh, organic uh, layer that's interpreted as a kind of bedding or mat, so it's really very exceptional preservation for the middle Paleolithic. And you can see some activity uh, to kind of centers of lithic napping. So, <clears throat> so those are kind of the extremes that I'm working with. Uh, here I have plotted, I have put together all seven sites the, uh, of the site maps. So all the dots are the lithics that were all piece, piece plotted. Um, and then I put them on the same spatial on the same scale. So you can see La Foily, uh, which is a very small site. Uh, Cantelouet uh, and Bossuet, the, these are both of the sites situated on raw material sources where it's extremely, extremely dense. And then some of the other sites like Le Prise, uh, Betancourt, uh, Frenois, these are all the sites up in the north of France, uh, in Lust deposits, um, oh, I'm sorry, in Angulia Adam, Le Prise is down south. Um, but uh, they're uh, much, they're very large sites, not quite as dense. Um, so the challenge here was I wanted to create a way of looking at these seven sites that I could compare them. Uh, I could compare this very small site, such as La Foily, the, um, the uh, distribution of lithics at that site, to a site such as Villiers Adam, which you can see is very huge, or a site like uh, Champs de Bossuet or Cante Louette, where they're extremely, extremely dense. Um, and I was also, this most of this material was collect, you know, this. This material was documented by the INRAC researchers, and uh, they also did all the lithic analysis. So I wanted to um, make use of this just amazing data set 
to kind of try to bring together uh, French and American traditions or French and North American traditions of lithic analysis. And then of course, because it's France, I also had really amazing refitting data. So I had uh, all of these sites were uh, subject to refit analysis. So um, I had that kind of level of, um, of that data set as well. So the first uh, technique I came up with was uh, to do something that a lot of other people have done with, um, with uh, intrasite spatial analysis, and that's just simply to make density maps to kind of look at the distribution of, um, of lithic pieces. And so this is just an example from one site, Betancourt. So I used ArcGIS to create a density map of the distribution of lithics. And then I wanted to segregate the high, the very dense, high, the areas very high in density uh, from the medium density areas to the low density areas. So instead of comparing high density areas to one another, like uh, you might do in the pursuit of activity areas or something like that, you know, I figured that this was probably the result of the same activity, lithic mapping. And so I just wanted to convert, okay, what's, let's see uh, what uh, technical categories are in the high density areas, the mi middle, and then the low density areas. And so I did the same uh, kind of analysis, on, and I used some um, contours. So these contours are just based on the, the uh, density map to segregate these areas. And so I'll just go over the results of this one analysis. Uh, I just used these two sites just to kind of show you uh, two examples, but it was the same at, at all the sites. So here's uh, Le Creuset and here's Brainois. So what I found, looking at the technological categories, I looked at, I grouped them. So you know the French have done a really wonderful chaîne apparatoire approach to look at all the different technological categories, but I grouped them into larger categories such as core maintenance flakes, um, well, of course, I, I kept Lavalois flakes. Um, most of these sites, a lot of were Lavalois or, or um, discoidal reduction. Or um, debris, all the smaller pieces, pieces smaller than three uh, centimeters. And so I tried to look and I compared, okay, what's overrepresented, underrepresented in each of these density areas? And then I used confidence intervals to see if they were statistically significant. And so when you look at the high density areas, well, they were overrepresented in things like um, the napping debris, so all those small pieces. Um, also, um, also things like cortical flakes, core maintenance flakes. So all of this debris that you would associate with um, with napping. And then, but because these areas were such high in density, although they were overrepresented in these categories, there were still a lot of usable blanks, a lot of lavala, a lot of. Um, um, uh, non uh, non cortical pieces also in these in these high density areas. Now in the in the middle density areas, these I, I hypotheses to be hypothesized to be kind of areas where you might see more mixing. So you might see intentional displacement of objects from where they were napped, but also a lot of things that were moved through trampling, through geological processes, and other um, phenomena like that. Uh, and so here we do see um, a mixture of napping debris and things like Lavala, but then also um, uh, products such as Lavala flakes or uh, tools, non cortical flakes. So you see a mix of these two things in the middle uh, density areas. And then in the low density parts of the site, we see overrepresentation of tools, of retouch pieces, and we see uh, overrepresentation representation of non-cortical flakes, Lavalwa flakes, blades. So this is kind of what you would expect as you look at um, the napping in one spatial location and then the movement of these lithics out to other parts of the site. But I wanted to also make use of that other data set, the refitting data set, um, which is really a, which would provide kind of what, whereas when you're looking at all the lithics um, together, you're seeing also a lot of noise. So when I'm looking at just a scale of the refitted artifacts, so all these pieces I know were at one, spati what, one spatial location because they were in the same nodule together. Um, and then I want to look at the spread of how these pieces spread out from one another. Because when I was plotting uh, the refitting sets looking at the spatial patterning, I saw the same pattern over and over again, which was that there was always a few, the most were clustered in a small spatial area, a few were 
several meters away, and then one or two is moved across the site. And so I wanted to find a way to kind of quantify this pattern I saw um, over and over again. So I decided to kind of do some measurements on the scale of each refitted group, each refitting set. And so first, I would measure, I would find the lithics that were closest together, and I would, and all that were within one meter of one of one another, uh, that would be in uh, refitting group one. Those that were uh, between uh, two and three meters of group one, that's uh, group two. And then those lithics that were moved more than three meters away from group two, uh, we're putting up group three. And so I chose these numbers just because it seemed like they captured that pattern the best. Also group one, you know, this is um, one meter is kind of what a lot of um, experimental uh, napping has shown that when you're napping, it usually stays within one meter of the napper. And so that's why I chose that for group one. And then I, I just tried to look at um, what would capture this pattern the best in terms of the other groups. But either way, I measured this at each in, at the scale of each uh, refitting set. And so in the end, because I had quite a lot of uh, refitted material, I could look at some kind of robust patterns. And this kind of, um, and the results from this analysis really mimicked what I saw at the scale of, of the assemblage as a whole. So when I looked in group one, so all these pieces fit tightly that were located tight together. Well, we see a lot of core reduction debris, cortical flakes, uh, core maintenance flakes, um, small pieces. There weren't as many uh, de debris places refitted just because it's very difficult to refit, but in places where they were present. Uh, of course, in this, the same thing with this uh, group two, just like in the density contour analysis, we see uh, a mixture of core reduction debris, but also, also these products or these intentional pieces. And then finally, in um, group three, we see these pieces that were moved intentionally across the site. So we uh, retouched pieces, Lavalois flakes, uh, <coughs> and non cortical flakes. So this is kind of matching what we see at the, um, um, from the other analysis. So I made this kind of schematic here just to or this little animation just to kind of illustrate what, what we're seeing here, because together these two analyses are really documenting the formation of the site structure. So we have the introduction of a nodule to the site. It's reduced in one location. And then some lithics are moved away from a multitude of processes, some intentional, some unintentional movements, some geological. And then we see this happening again and again with different nodules. Um, and then, of course, we also have the introduction of some lithics that were not mapped on site. And so we have with the um, refitting analysis, I have it documented on the level of each of these cores of each of these nodules, so you can see uh, with each different color. But then the density contour analysis maps the same kind of process, but a little bit um, with a little more noise uh, at, at the scale of the site. So together, these can be very, two very powerful uh, analyses that are looking at two different scales. And um, you can see that uh, they really, yeah, like I said, they really uh, document the formation of the site structure in these sites, especially these sites that are really focused on lithic napping. So um, they're really forming the, a lot of lithic napping is occurring in particular spatial locations where you find very, very dense debris of, of majority uh, it, it is a different, um, core reduction debris, but you're also getting a lot of, of usable blanks. They're opening a new core before they, um, before they need to. You know, there's still a lot of nice Lavalois lakes and stuff like that being left in place. But these are areas where they're not really, um, they're not getting an economic push to, to use all of the available nice blanks because there's raw materials right there. So yeah, I kind of got into this, but they can be considered raw material workshops, but other activities are taking place there. So there is all this napping uh, taking place, but um, from there at each site, there have been um, use for analyses, and they found that there's a lot of other activities in terms of um, butchering, uh, hide working, 
wood processing. And we can kind of just suppose that these activities are likely taking place on site because uh, lithics are moving across site, likely in some cases to be utilized there. Now, of course, in a lot of these sites, lithics are also being removed from the site, but certainly some uh, activities are taking place at the site as well. And so this is the case of all the sites, even those that are situated directly on those super dense sites right on lithic raw material, on the, on the sources of raw material. So yeah, like what I said, they don't really need to economize the raw materials. There are plenty available, but that doesn't mean they're not using really uh, these well-established and operatoire that we know, you know, the Lavalla method, we know from a lot of different studies that it really does economize raw materials. So probably it's other things, you know, like custom culture that is prompting them to use these extremely um, highly organized uh, methods of uh, core production. Well, I'm out of time, but those, the, the, the main point is that together you can use these, uh, these two, these two uh, methods to kind of look at site formation and to really understand about how lithics are being produced and utilized at uh, archaeological sites. So thank you very much. And